Hi there, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Ailey Callender. I'm a solicitor at the Scottish Parliament, and thank you very much for joining us uh, from wherever you are today. I'm delighted uh, to join these presenters and moderate this joint event between the University of Edinburgh and Privis International, which will focus on the regulation of political micro-targeting. In terms of structured for today, just to let you know, we will be recording this presentation um, and uh, it'll start off um, with Lucy from PI and then it will go over to the University of Edinburgh where we have Paolo, uh, Hashim, Iona and Mariana from the University of Edinburgh and they'll each present on various aspects of the report and then Laura from Privacy International will conclude. We have until 3.15 so there's plenty of time for questions um, with the speakers. So please add your questions to the chat box at any point throughout and I can collate them as we go along and then there'll be plenty of time to put those to the speakers at the end. Um, so as you know, uh, having joined the event, Privacy International and the University of Edinburgh work together to explore the legal frameworks governing political micro-targeting in six different countries. Uh, this is all the more relevant in these times where political campaigns are increasingly digital and online and I'm looking forward to hearing from the speakers about their work and, and this report and I hope you are too. So without further ado I'll hand over to Lucy. Thank you Ailey, good afternoon everyone, thanks for joining us and happy Data Privacy Day. This is a very good day for us to be doing this presentation. Um, my name is Lucy Purden, I'm the Policy Director at Privacy International and PI is a UK based charity that works to defend the right to privacy as it intersects with modern technologies around the world. So as I'm a first speaker, I wanted to present the overarching issues of what we're going to be talking about today and help set up the presentation for the, uh, the team at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm going to briefly outline what micro-targeting is and why we're concerned about it in general terms, and then go into the different stages of micro-targeting to highlight more specifically why we're concerned about it and why it's problematic and then talk a little bit about the actions that PI is taking and how the University of Edinburgh project contributes to that. So firstly when we talk about micro-targeting we're talking about an online marketing strategy that's part of a multi-billion dollar advertising industry and this is used by commercial and political actors in order to send different messages to different groups either to persuade people to buy a certain product or vote for a particular political party. And this explains why you often think that you're being followed around the web, seeing the same advert again and again, relating to something that you've searched for or receiving messages from political parties about issues in your area or issues that you're interested in. And from where you are sitting as a user, What's visible to you in this process are the platforms on one side where you see content, including the adverts, and then on the other side, there are the advertisers that want you to see that content. But to make that happen in the middle, there is a whole ecosystem of data brokers, ad tech companies, political consultancies involved in micro-targeting, which is driving this industry that's based on collecting, buying and selling your data. And this is mostly invisible to you as a user. The companies involved are mostly not household names. You probably won't have a relationship with them or interact with them directly, but they know a lot about you because it's their business to do so. So at PI, we're very concerned about this lack of transparency in the industry because where there is little transparency, exploitation is rife. And where actions are invisible, it takes control away from you as a user. Because as a data subject, you can't exercise your rights under data protection law if you don't know what data is being collected about you and how it's being used. So at PI, we're working very hard to chip away at this secretive industry. And so we're very happy to be collaborating with the team at University of Edinburgh on this project. So one way to describe the process of micro-targeting is that it's like a Russian doll. There are layers of complexity and surprises when it comes to the sources of data and how it's being used. And broadly speaking, there are three stages, data collection, profiling, and targeting. And data collection is the first step in this long and opaque process. And data collection, as far as we're concerned, is out of control. So broadly speaking, once your data has been collected, it becomes very difficult to control, to find out which companies hold your data and what they're doing with it. So we need to tackle this. And we often talk about data collection in the abstract to the point that it almost sounds harmless, but it's not. 
And we found at PI through our investigations that data can come from some surprising and quite shocking sources. So for example, one of our investigations a couple of years ago analyzed 136 mental health websites in France, Germany, and the UK. And we found that 76% of those websites contained third party trackers for marketing purposes. So not just for the functioning of the site. And we also found that several online tests for depression were sharing the actual test answers with third parties. Now, the average user would not expect this sensitive information to be collected by so many actors and perhaps fed into a database that feeds the advertising industry and maybe even political campaigning. So this is a, one example of how, of how we're very concerned about the transparency. The second uh, stage in micro-targeting is the profiling. And this involves dividing users into small groups or segments based on characteristics such as personality traits or interests, background or previous voting behavior. And that's based on the data that's been collected about you. And as a result, things have been inferred or assumed about you to make these profiles. So a big concern here is that this process of profiling might not just be happening to target you with adverts. These profiles generated could be used for many other purposes and could de inform decisions that are made about you without you knowing, such as getting a mortgage or taking out a loan or increasing the price of health insurance, for example. And we've even seen reports of companies selling profiles to law enforcement to um, track people who might be at risk of reoffending. And then you get to the targeting itself in the last stage of micro-targeting. So this is where personalized content is distributed using online platforms, reaching the group that they want to with these tailor-made targeted messaging. And this could be commercial or political. And my colleague, Laura, will talk a little bit more about the consequences and harms of this after um, the University of Edinburgh have presented. But in summary, why are you as a user seeing a particular advert or message online? It's because you've been profiled. It's because data has been collected from a variety of sources, often without you knowing anything about it. So at Privacy International, we're calling for transparency of this industry and the limits on data collection. And so we highlight um, abuses of data collection and profiling through our investigations, bring them to the attention of the public and also the regulators where necessary. And we've done this in France regarding the mental health website example, and in Ireland and the UK regarding um, complaints about eight ad tech and data brokers and credit reference agencies that we made. So we also provide guides for users on how to exercise their rights as a data subject, such as how to submit a data subject access request or how to request deletion of your data. And we've also published guides on how to limit um, tracking online and um, how to limit being targeted with adverts. So just to sum up, why is this University of Edinburgh research so important? It's because the state of data protection across the world is not consistent. So we see, you know, some countries have no data protection laws, other countries or regions do have laws, and some are good, but the problem is enforcement, they're not being enforced as we would like to see. And then when you get into the quite novel uses of personal data, such as micro targeting for political campaigning, this is where it gets a bit messy because micro targeting should not be taking place where transparency and lawfulness isn't offered to users, but we need to know what those laws are in order to hold the entities to account. So as the report shows um, that the University of Edinburgh are going to present, the laws are different across countries and we can see a lot of gaps and a few problems. So on that note, I'm going to hand back to Ailey to hand over to the University of Edinburgh to present the findings of their excellent research. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lucy, for that introduction. And um, for those of you that have joined us in the time from when we kicked off until now, just to let you know, if you have any questions at all, please pop them in the chat box and we'll collate them and there'll be plenty of time for questions for the speakers at the end. And with that, I'll hand over to Paolo, uh, Hashim, Iona and Mariana um, to hear about the work that the University of Edinburgh did. Thank you very much, um, Ailey, and thank you very much, Lucy, for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction and setup of the problem. I hope you can, guys, can see um, a quick slide that I'm um, trying to um, share here. Um, that should be that should be. Uh, 
Okay, okay, that is great. That is great. Thank you very much. So, um, what I will um, what I will try to illustrate as a way to kickstart the conversation is to somehow give a sense of the background issues in our work before uh, my colleagues then discuss the specific aspects of the regulation of micro targeting campaigns. And as you've seen, perhaps in the, um, in, in the study or in the presentation of this event, these, um, these, these, these analysis covers six countries, such as Brazil, Canada, France, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And uh, we hope that all together, these countries offer um, enough of an overview of different approaches. And we choose these countries in particular because they've all been quite active over the last few years in, um, in passing new legislation or regulation on the topic. So hopefully taken together, they can offer quite a, a comprehensive and an up-to-date perspective. And we started this study by looking at how in each of these jurisdictions, the problem of micro-targeting of political messages is defined um, in the first place. And we found that actually the majority of these countries that does not provide a specific um, definition with Canada and the UK being perhaps the outliers in this respect. Here in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the National Data Protection Authority in a way, has provided um, quite a detailed definition. Um, you should be able to see it in the, in the slide, hopefully. Uh, and then it goes on to add that micro-targeting may determine what and how relevant content is delivered to an individual online. So in a sense, it covers both the aspects of um, everything that comes upstream, the collection uh, of data and uh, uh, cross matching for profiling purposes, and then somehow the um, outwards aspect of it with uh, um, the sending of targeted messages to individual voters. The other countries that we examined um, instead only provide some short or indirect references to micro-targeting practices. For instance, in Italy, the National Data Protection Authority identifies specific types of processing that entail collecting lifestyle data and collecting personal data through social networks separately without providing an overarching definition of the whole process. And, uh, and, and chain of actions, if you, if you want to call them that way, that lead to the possibility of sending personalized political messages to individuals. So there is a lack of, a, of an overarching coherent perspective over the whole problem, the whole different actions that all together contribute to making possible this practice. Canada, is a, in a sense, is a very interesting example of a jurisdiction that has attempted to provide a definition both at the federal and at the district level. So both the government of Canada and the governments of um, um, specific districts um, have attempted to provide their own definition of the, of the problem. And there seems to be some, there seem to be some slight differences of perspective between the two levels. So we see, for instance, that the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, uh, which is a data protection at the, at the federal level, defined micro-targeting in a, in a report, by the way, so this is not a statutory definition. But yet, in this report, um, micro-targeting was defined as the refined segmentation uh, according to a host of demographic and attitudinal variables. So it emphasizes, in a sense, the aspect of profiling. While the um, Office of the Information and uh, Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia, so at the district level, the lower level, defines micro-targeting as when a very narrow and highly specific category of people are chosen as an advertising target. So there seems to be more of an emphasis on the communication element. So from the first, from our analysis, um, and in particular in regard to this first aspect, 
we have at least two generalized trends or um, aspects that I think we can highlight. First, we have we have seen already um, the definitions provided by uh, regulatory authorities are starting to prove instrumental on other public bodies, like, for instance, in the UK, the definition provided by the ICO has been relied on by both the Scottish Law Commission and the Law Commission for England and Wales. So perhaps this is a first pattern that I think would be useful to highlight, that we are seeing uh, what is possibly a generalized trend of certain foundational principles or definitions being set up by regulatory authorities rather than parliaments or other branches of government. Second, uh, the general lack of comprehensive definitions is important in practice for one reason specifically, that political micro-targeting, um, as Lucy explained before, is the result of a chain of different actions. Um, so there is the collection of unique identifiers through different channels, the collection of data on individuals' lifestyle and habits, and then these different types of data have to be matched together to create more detailed profiles of individuals. And then in the end, these profiles are used to send different messages to individuals based on what the data tell about them. So for instance, we have seen a couple of years ago, um, you may remember it, the case of new patterns, mostly new mothers receiving electoral messages specifically about family policy from one political party that had got hold of their data from a parenting website uh, that these people had, uh, had subscribed to. But when rulemakers fail to identify all the different actions as part of one whole process, then we have different regulatory frameworks kicking in at different stages. So for instance, you would have data protection laws regulating what data can be collected. And then for instance, communication laws or political advertising laws, uh, which is also by the way, regulated in a very different way across European countries um, coming into play in the face of sending out individual messages. So on the one hand, it is true that all these different phases are in most cases subject to some legal framework already. But on the other hand, it's also true that all these different frameworks are often inconsistent one with another, or they can respond to different logics. So in turn, these, is con these inconsistencies and often um, loopholes can quite easily be exploited. So this piecemeal approach and the lack of a streamlined, um, clear framework also makes the existing rules um, where there are quite obscure and difficult to identify even, even more than to apply. I think my colleagues here can agree that even where we were conducting the background research, we had to spend a fair amount of time just identifying what provisions would regulate uh, what activity in each country. And then uh, since provisions also have been passed at different times, uh, we also try to understand whether one provision would supersede another and when. Um, so even if just mapping out the relevant frameworks is quite a challenge, then of course, enforcing these rules uh, can only be all the more difficult. So the lack of clear frameworks is another problem that I think um, comes across quite clearly from our research. And it's something that hopefully rulemakers are increasingly becoming aware of. Then whether or not they will um, act on this, on this knowledge is, the, is a separate question, of course, but hopefully um, this is a starting point. So given this lack of comprehensive frameworks, uh, we went on to look at the specific provisions that apply most closely to each main stage of this chain of actions, specifically the collection of individual data, both the identifiers and data on lifestyle, and then how these different categories of data are matched together for um, profiling individual voters 
And finally, how um, these, these, these profiles are used to send personalized political messages um, to voters. Um, so I, I think at this point, I would um, give the floor to Hashem, who um, will present more on the um, first specific phase, the collection of personal data. Um, sorry, just to interrupt briefly, um, that was really good, Paolo. Just to check that we're all seeing the correct slide. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to switch, but um, oh, just to um, keep an eye on the, on the slide. Okay, I will, so I will, I will um, yeah, that was possibly the wrong one. Sorry about that. I'll try off. Um, um, so Ashim, please keep going and I'll try to um, fix it meanwhile. Okay, a uh, bit of technical difficulties I can see. Um, I'll be happy to share the slides on my end if that's not a problem. If you can, if you can yeah, that may be. Um, no, I think we're on the right slide this time. That's perfect. Should be. That's great. Right, great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Paolo, for that introduction. Um, my name is Hashim. I'm part of the research team here at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, I'm delighted to work on this project. I'll simply be giving you uh, an overview of uh, the process of collecting voter data, which I think is the first and arguably most important step of any political micro-targeting campaign. So the more data points you have about a person, the better able you are to profile them. And the better the profiling, at least theoretically, the more effective the targeted message. Now, in our research, we examined the legal frameworks that govern the collection of this data, which is set out in greater detail in the paper, including the specific citations of the law. I will not be making any detailed references here, and I will just try to give you an overview of the six states, pointing out some similarities and gaps in the law. Now, firstly, how is data for political campaigning collected? Now, campaigners have been collecting voter data to identify their interests, voting preferences, and degree of support for a very long time uh, through engaging directly with the electorate, such as through door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, however, campaigns are also increasingly now reliant on indirect forms of data collection. Um, one of the sources of this data is the electoral register. Now, the data collected from the register usually acts as a spine, um, providing baseline information about a voter upon which political parties then collate an add-on to build a more complete profile. Now, what kind of information is contained on the electoral registers? In the six countries that were examined, it was noted that there are some similarities. For example, all registers contained at least the name and address of the voter then each country has specific add-ons. So in the UK, uh, the register also includes the electoral number of the voter. In Spain, it also includes the national identity number. Um, in France and Italy, uh, the register also includes the date and place of birth of the voter. And in Canada, the system is interesting because there's a differentiated framework where at the federal level, um, we also have details such as the date of birth and gender. And notably, voter registration here entails a collection of a significant amount of data, including uploading a photo ID during normal voter registration or special ballots. And additional information may also be included depending on the identity of the voter. Um, for example, members of the armed forces also provide their service numbers. And it's also worth noting that um, the chief electoral officer may actually request for additional information, though this is discretionary. Um, there's also more information that may be uh, actually given at a provincial level. So you have uh, 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 election at, sorry, at the district level, like in Alberta, for example, uh, the list could include telephone numbers. Um, so there is a significant difference between what voter data is collected by the electoral agencies and that which is shared with other people. So who has access to this information and what purposes may it be used for? Now, there's a general consensus that political parties ought to have some access to some of the data in the electoral register for political campaigning. 
Now in the UK, for example, there are two registers with different levels of access. There's a full register, which includes the name and address of everyone who is registered to vote and an edited register, which contains only the data of those electors who have not opted out of it. Now, access to the full register is limited to government departments, political parties, candidates, and credit reference agencies. The open register, on the other hand, can be purchased by anyone upon payment of a fee, and it is routinely acquired by marketing firms and other businesses. Now, the UK situation we note is fairly unique, at least in a European context, as the rest of the countries are more restrictive, either in terms of who can access the register, what data they can collect, and what they can use this data for. Italy, for example, only allows access for electoral campaigning and political communication. So the access and purpose for which it's used is extremely limited. France also limits it to those involved in political campaigning who cannot use it for commercial purposes. In Spain, the law seems to be particularly restrictive as it limits access to candidates or their representatives and any access requests must be made through judicial channels. Outside Europe, we have a more open access system. For example, in Brazil, um, it allows political parties and private individuals to access the data with no clear purpose limitation. In Canada, which we noted collects a fair amount of voter data, makes up for this somewhat by equally providing a relatively strict framework of both what can be accessed as well as what it can be used for. So out of all the data that I mentioned has been collected, only the names, addresses, and electoral number can be released to a political party. Now, the usage is also limited to communicating with electors. Um, districts run along the same lines. And in a perhaps interesting case is the one of British Columbia, which allows the chief electoral officer to include fictitious voter information in the list so that they can track any unauthorized use of the list. We can see from this sort of general overview there's some similarities in a European context where commercial entities are either explicitly barred from accessing the data by limiting access to political parties and candidates, or implicitly through a purpose limitation by limiting it only for political campaigning and not commercial purposes. The UK therefore seems to be an outlier in this regard. We also see some obvious gaps. Um, for example, although most countries have taken steps to either limit access to the data or what it may be used for, these tools are fairly blunt instruments. Limiting use to wide terms such as, quote, political campaigning or electoral propaganda does not exclude the activity of micro-targeting, which can easily fit into either of these categories. Now, the second aspect which is used to build on this is collecting data on individual lifestyles. So the data that is accessed from the electoral register is generic. You know that a person is a voter, and in most cases, their name and address. Political parties therefore build on this spine by collecting more granular data that will facilitate building detailed profiles. I will focus on the methods of indirect collection, such as purchasing data from third parties or mining data from social media platforms, as these are the forms that a voter is unlikely to be able to give informed consent to. As a general note for the EU, indirect collection of personal data, while not prohibited, is hindered by the GDPR, which is applicable in Italy, France, and Spain. For example, the data minimization principle would be breached by blanket collection of personal data, particularly where sensitive personal data is concerned, such as a subject's political opinions and ethnicity. There are, however, a few important differences in the approaches between member states, some of which I will briefly mention. A little Brexit note here, um, the GDPR is an EU regulation and it no longer applies to the UK. However, it has been already incorporated significantly into UK law. And in practice, there's little change to the core principles, rights and obligations. There are differences in other areas, which is a discussion for another time. Um, but now I'll briefly go through the legality of these forms of indirect collection in the six states. Now, the UK Information Commissioner's Office has issued detailed guidance on this. And while it relates to the GDPR, it is safe to assume that it continues to apply today. Collecting a voter's contact information from a third party is only unlawful if the data subject gives 
is only lawful if the data subject gives explicit and specific consent. Right? So collection of other personal data is permissible where the data subject is given appropriate information, which includes the political party's privacy policy. Now, political parties are also required to carry out due diligence to ensure that the third party obtained the personal data lawfully and that the individuals understood their details would be passed on specifically for political communication. And if the political party is unsatisfied that this has been done, it should not use the data. Now, data from social media can be processed by political parties. However, a key factor that is stressed by the informational commissioner is that the public availability of information does not automatically deprive it of protection. Now, the French DPA has also issued guidance which touches on similar issues. Notably though, it goes into a bit more detail on obtaining data from social media. Parties are forbidden from collecting data from users which the party has no contact with. And occasional contacts such as those who interact with posts by say liking it, but also provide consent to, for data collection. Even the data of those users in regular contact with them through direct messages cannot be harvested and used on other channels. Spain is interesting because it's particularly restrictive. There are two requirements which seem to have the effect of banning data, banning the collection of data for the purposes of micro-targeting. Firstly, processing data in order to identify a data subject's ideology, trade union membership, sexual orientation, or beliefs is banned, even where the individual has consented to it. Secondly, any activity that may pose a risk to data subject requires an impact assessment report as well as an advisory opinion of the Spanish DPA. Now in Italy, a clear distinction is made between data that can be used without the subject's consent, which includes that available from public registries, such as their uh, registrar of the electorate. Now, the, the interesting thing about Italy is that they also have a separate category, which must uh, have consent in order to process, which is data from internet obtained through scraping or even that which is publicly available on their social media profiles. In Brazil, we also see an emphasis on explicit consent uh, for processing sensitive personal data, which directly implicates collection from micro-targeting. We also see an emphasis on the principles of transparency, data minimization, and purpose limitations that we see in other jurisdictions. Now, Canada is an entirely different story and represents the laxest system in this regard. Political parties are not subject to federal privacy laws and instead are governed by a special regime which simply requires them to submit and publish policies for protecting personal information. There are no minimum standards here, nor is there any oversight by an independent body. The only uh, place in Canada which political parties are required to follow federal uh, privacy laws or specific privacy frameworks is British Columbia, where political parties are subject to date, uh, these privacy laws provided they collect data within British Columbia or about British Columbians. And this provincial law applies to them and imposes similar requirements for consent, data minimization, and purpose limitation, as we see in other jurisdictions. From this sort of overview, uh, the certain similarities. Um, first of all, in at least five of the states, political parties are generally required to obtain consent to collect and process data obtained through third parties or through scraping data from social media. Uh, moreover, there's an increased focus on transparency where the purpose of using data for political communication is now generally expected to be communicated explicitly. The clear differences are, and the most striking of which, is that in most states, consent is considered to be a lawful ground for processing data, whereas in Spain, some categories of data cannot be processed even with consent. Canada's system, as noted, is particularly lax, at least outside of British Columbia. Um, that is sort of a general overview and some specific comments on gaps in the law. Um, that will be it for me, and I will glad to hand back to my colleagues to take you through the rest of the presentation that deals with data cross-matching and profiling, as well as sending personalized messages. Um, thank you, Hashim. I don't know if you're able to, to carry, oh, that's great. Thank you for, for, for swapping the slide there. Um, yeah, there you go. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Iona and uh, thanks again to Hashim for setting out these different approaches to the collection of voter data and, and also helpfully outlining the GDPR's relevance post-Brexit. Um, I am now going to continue the section of the presentation by discussing the legal frameworks that govern how this data, once it has been collected in the ways just outlined, is then used by political campaigns to profile individual and groups of voters. Uh, so as outlined by Laura, profiling can be defined in this context as the automated processing of personal data to analyse individual behaviours and characteristics. In doing this, um, I suppose a profile can be built up of that individual, comprising of a wide range of information on their location, preferences, economic situation, health, performance at work, and many, many other personal details. Clearly, this kind of information can be employed not only to determine a person's political leanings and predict their voting intentions, but also going beyond that to influence how they may vote in the future. On that basis, profiling can, can obviously be hugely valuable to any political campaign and its proper regulation is essential. So I will structure my summary of the varying approaches considered in our report in, in three parts. By way of a very brief overview, I will start by considering the consistency between law and guidance across some of the different jurisdictions considered. Following this, I, will, um, I intend to, to compare practice in the UK and Canada specifically as two examples of relatively effective governance in this regard. And I'll conclude by very briefly discussing the particular issue of consent in the context of data taken from social networks as an area in need of close attention going forward. So moving then to consistency in approaches to the regulation of data profiling, um, a useful starting point is the GDPR. Um, Article 22 of the regulation makes provision on the subject and specifically it provides that profiling is not permissible without explicit consent of the individual concerned, where it would have a, and this is a quote from Article 22 itself, a legal or similarly significant effect. I'll go into the interpretation of that in a little bit more detail um, in the context of the UK's information commissioner's interpretation. Um, but what I would say in this introduction is that in spite of this provision under the GDPR, there remains a very notable divergence in the extent of guidance that is produced by EU member state government authorities on the use of profiling, particularly where this is carried out in the course of political campaigning. Whereas jurisdictions such as France and Spain are highlighted in our report for noticeable shortfalls in the extent of guidance that is provided, Italy and the UK have much more fully developed domestic regimes. Then out with the GDPR context, there is clearly scope for considerable variation, um, but I think the most notable of these um, is possibly the, the inapplicability of the Canadian federal rules to the public sector, um, as outlined by Hashim, and which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail again below. So uh, given that regulation in this area is, is not uniform, I think it's helpful to compare some of the different practices considered in our report. Um, and the UK and Canada have relatively well-developed rules on data profiling, which although by no means perfect, certainly demonstrate different ways of using effectively drafted guidance. Starting with the UK then, um, the guidance provided by the UK Information Commissioner's Office clearly sets out interpretation of GDPR profiling rules in the context of elections and political campaigns. In addressing the Article 22 requirement that there must be a clear and direct link between the profiling and the legal or similarly significant effect, the ICO acknowledges that in the context of voting, an individual's decision is often influenced by a very wide range of factors, and this can make it difficult to establish cause and effect. 
it is concluded that where the effect of profiling is to change a voter's political opinion, this is unlikely to be deemed similarly significant to a purely legal effect, such as the right to vote itself. However, this is not to say that profiling for political purposes will never reach that GDPR threshold, at which point explicit consent becomes mandatory. The ICO accepts that the cumulative effect of numerous considerations may cause such profiling to have a legal or similarly significant effect on an individual, including a lack of knowledge about how that data is being used, the techniques employed, as well as the way in which that profiling will be used going forward. By way of an example, where the method or outcome of profiling contains an element of threat, if it's discriminatory in its nature, or if it seeks to manipulate or disenfranchise an individual, it is considered by the ICO as meeting the Article 22 test. Of course, these terms are all very subjective in their na nature. Um, and for that reason, I think the ICO's approach in compiling a list of questions to assist in determining whether Article 22 is engaged by profiling carried out in the course of political campaigning is um, particularly helpful. These questions which the ICO have compiled include prompts such as, is the profiling particularly intrusive? Is the combination of the profiling of personal data alongside the nature of the message um, of a particular type that is highly emotive and could affect the individual? And is the profiling and targeting likely to cause detriment to the individual? In the event that these questions can be answered in the affirmative, the ICO provides a further list of requirements that must be met. Not only must explicit consent be obtained, it will also be necessary to conduct a data protection impact assessment as Hashim has outlined, inform the data subject of how their data is being used and provide meaningful information about the reasons for and consequences of profiling in these circumstances. So comparing this case study with Canada in a little bit more detail, I think Canada takes a, a similar approach to consent requirements in terms of primary legislation being supported by guidance. Under federal law, an organisation may collect, use or disclose personal information only for purposes that a reasonable person would consider are appropriate in the circumstances. Then at the provincial level in British Columbia, this has been interpreted as requiring explicit consent for all profiling, since this practice is not obvious to a reasonable person. Furthermore, under the federal primary legislation, knowledge and consent of the individual are required for the collection, use or disclosure of personal information, except where inappropriate. And an organization should generally seek express consent when the information is likely to be considered sensitive. Again, in the Canadian context, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner extends this to the context of political campaigning by clarifying that personal information will often be sensitive when that is used or disclosed for political purposes. As mentioned earlier, the key difference between the UK and Canadian federal regimes is that under the latter, data cross-matching and profiling by political parties is not regulated by federal law. These privacy laws cover only those commercial third party entities which carry out profiling on behalf of political parties. However, it should be noted that, can that Canada is under significant pressure to keep pace with European privacy protection standards and it is expected that the key legislation will eventually be reviewed and possibly extended to cover the public sector also. The final point I want to very briefly pick up from Hashim um, and touch on in concluding this section of the approach, uh, this section of the presentation, is the approach taken by different regimes towards consent for the use of data collected from social networks. There is quite clear instruction, I think, on the use of social network data from political communications in France, where the consent of internet users is considered to be an absolute requirement. However, there is a notable lack of detail regarding how that consent should be obtained. In Italy, 
Fuller guidance is available on the subject of informed consent to online profiling, specifically the accessibility of consent notices and transparent communication of the purposes which such data will be used. And similarly, the UK's um, ICO has warned that the act of an individual making their personal data public via social media does not in itself imply consent to this being used for political campaigning purposes. By contrast, the provincial law approach in Canada is that where an individual directly communicates with a political party using social media, they impliedly consent to that party collecting their data and using this for future communication with that individual, um, although not profiling in itself. The justification for implied consent in this context is that the user understands the nature of the platform and has voluntarily communicated with that party. I think it's really this final issue which will likely require the most consideration going forwards and a more unified approach between the jurisdictions is definitely needed. The solution will be inextricably bound up with the development of rules on social media based personalised communications um, and it's on that topic that I will now hand over to Mariana to discuss in more detail. Hello everyone. Thanks again for joining us. And I'll address the third stage of micro-targeting that Lucy mentioned at the beginning. And it is sending a personalized communication to a data subject. And this is also called direct marketing. So in plain words, a personalized communication is telling someone something that we know that will affect that person or that person will pay attention to. And what happens here is that all the data processing, the profiling and the cross-checking of information leads to knowing what must be said and how it must be said to effectively impact a specific data subject and trigger a desired and foreseen reaction in that individual. So ultimately, and as Hashim said, the data processing aims at increasing the effectiveness of a speech or a message so that it will affect a person. And when we're talking about political micro-targeting, a personalized communication intends to promote a candidate or influence a voter. And this activity directly reaches the data subjects. So it is a very topical matter for the jurisdictions that we reviewed in our research project. And basically all of them have regulated those personalized communications to ensure transparency of the information um, in the message that is delivered to the data subjects. And in general, we found that the regulations point out that those personalized communications must clearly state their nature and their origins. So, for example, the regulations in Spain, in Italy, state that you that the, the personalized communication must clearly reveal that those are political ads and who are sending those communications. So the source and the sender must be clearly determined. Um, however, um, what we also noticed was that the, the scope of those regulations is quite heterogeneous. So that creates certain gaps and limitations. And right now I want to highlight two of them, which you can check in the report. So the first one that we found is in the French regulation. And it is that the provisions apply as of three months before the election day. So there is a very narrow window for the provisions to be enforced. And in contrast, what we know is that micro-targeting for political purposes and personalized communications could happen differently and for more extended periods of time, if not to say always. Um, so again, this is a context and kind of a paradox. And the second finding uh, that we spotted is in the British regulation. And the thing is like the regulations, again, to clearly state that that is a political communication and clearly uh, evidence who is sending that only applies 
to the offline political campaigning messages. So the regulation does not apply to digital communications. And if we have this imprint requirement, again, this is quite paradoxical because what we have seen is that political micro-targeting mostly happens in the online world. Because all these tools for data processing and profiling are more accessible and ready to use there than in the hard copy or paper world. So um, what we see here is that these gaps and limitations that the regulation creates are also opportunities to improve. And like we want to emphasize that governments are taking the steps to understand and regulate this phenomenon. But still, like there is a need to regulate more or regulate better. And by better or more, what I mean is to be coherent with what the political micro-targeting practices are. Uh, so when we review who has made a coherent attempt in this regard, the Canadian regulation seems to be a very good example. It has ordered the creation of a repository of all political ads. And that repository is open to public consultation that can be accessed at any time by anyone. So what we see is that this approach towards transparency and overcoming limitations of setting a limited period of time, like it's, it's a lot more coherent with the phenomenon happening in the online world, but also empowers data subjects as they now have a tool that they can use to know and understand who is approaching them and for what reason. Um, but again, like across all the jurisdictions we studied, we only managed to put together this specific example of the Canadian regulation. So. The message, again, is clear. Jurisdictions want, want to ensure transparency by regulating personalized communication, and they have already started to do this. However, there's room for improvement. So governments definitely must carry on with their job in understanding and regulating how these communications work in the offline and the, all, in, and the online world. Um, and again, sometimes they could manage to regulate them uh, jointly or otherwise separately because they cannot be assimilated. Otherwise, we will end up with the case like the French regulation and the British regulation that they do not match what is happening with political micro-targeting. So um, again, like what we see is that governments definitely aim at transparency when regulating uh, personalized communications, but is a topic that still needs to be carried on and be further developed. Um, I'll say that that was the highlight and the main conclusion of that. So thanks again. Brilliant. Thank you, Mariana, and also to Iona and Hashim and Paolo. That was fascinating. It's really striking how different the approaches are despite the the common problem that everyone's facing. Um, so Laura, over to you for our final part of the presentation before we go to the questions. And thanks everyone for putting them in the chat box. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Lazaro Cabrera and I'm a legal officer with Privacy International. Um, in these last few minutes of our presentation, I'd like to take you through some of the challenges we've seen arise in practice, particularly with regard to the different regulators that have been discussed um, throughout this event. So I'd like to look briefly at three different types of regulators, online platforms themselves, electoral regulators, and data protection agencies that we've engaged with in this context and the challenges that we have seen come up in practice. So starting with online platforms, as a general rule, online platforms leave the responsibility for data processing and compliance with data protection frameworks entirely with advertisers. Obviously this rule ignores the reason why online platforms are attractive to advertisers in the first place because of their access to users information. So for those of you who use Facebook, I'd like to recommend a small quick exercise. Next time you see an ad on your newsfeed, click on the why am I seeing this ad option 
And when you do, you'll see some of the targeting criteria used by the advertiser, such as range, age range and location. Sometimes you'll come across something slightly more sinister, a brief explanation that the advertiser is targeting people who Facebook thinks are into vegetarianism or fitness or technology, as the case may be for those listening to the seminar. Sometimes it's obvious to you why Facebook would think that, and sometimes it's not. What is clear is that users are segmented by the platform itself based on perceived interests. And while you can see that interests have been attributed to you, you don't always know why. Political ads are trickier than this because the consequences can result in real harm to democracy. Our research, for example, has consistently shown that Google and Facebook apply different transparency standards to different countries. In some countries, advertiser checks and inclusion in some form of ad repository are compulsory. In others, they are optional or non-existent. The higher the level of transparency, naturally, the larger the possibility for civil society scrutiny. But of course, we don't know what makes social media platforms treat users differently for political campaigning. And that's not information that's available in the public domain. What we do know is that when governments try to control these levels of transparency, platforms get spooked. And that was the case in Canada, where Google banned political ads after a new electoral law was passed, compelling it to keep a register of political advertising. This ties in nicely with the next category of regulators that I'd like us to consider. So electoral regulators play a very important role in ensuring transparency of the tactics used and the relevant actors participating in political campaigning, both by imposing strict reporting requirements on political parties and making those reports available to the public. However, despite these efforts, it's not always clear who does what and what role they play in the micro-targeting process. In the UK, for example, the Electoral Commission provides a search register which the public can navigate to monitor the expenditure of different political parties. But the register doesn't identify whether advertising spend relates to online or offline advertising. There's also some inconsistency as to the labeling of expense categories. Expenses classed as advertising and market research and canvassing could overlap in the online campaigning context. Existing guidance doesn't provide much clarity on the extent of the overlap, making it difficult to pinpoint exactly which stages of micro-targeting correspond to whom. Colombia's electoral register takes a slightly different approach. Um, it publishes on its website all the entities having been directly contracted by political parties for political campaigning purposes, including a description of the service provided and the amount paid for it. This sounds satisfactory in practice. However, it does not cover subcontractors who may have been indirectly hired by a political party through a third party company. Therefore, some key actors in the micro-targeting network may remain obscure despite the best efforts of electoral regulators. Last but not least, data protection agencies can play an important role both in regulating the nature of political campaigning and the behavior of other actors that might be involved, even if indirectly, in the campaigning process. For instance, last year, the ICO published a report relating to its investigation on credit referencing agencies Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion for their offline marketing activities. The report found that these credit referencing agencies held information on virtually every adult in the UK. And we know that at least one of them works together with political parties. A separate investigation and online marketing by the ICO is currently pending. The Spanish Data Protection Agency, which has already been discussed by my fellow panelists, has taken on political campaigns slightly more directly, prohibiting political parties from using data analytics to infer a person's political preferences. For data revealing a political opinion to be lawfully used in political campaigning, it must have been freely expressed and this is a very high threshold to reach. But similarly, the scope of this restriction is limited. It only applies to political parties during the electoral period and to data revealing political opinion. So there, there remains to be seen what data protection agencies do to protect the full categories which pertain to sensitive information or special category data. To sum up, it's hard to say that any country or regulator has got it figured out, and I think that this finding is supported by the University of Edinburgh's research. However, a key issue going forward is to see how all regulators work together to target micro-targeting and to what extent they see their roles as complementary or mutually exclusive. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Laura, and, and to everyone. Um, it's uh, quite an overview of a vast amount of regulation um, and leaves that question as to, despite that, you know, how many gaps are there and is it effective in practice? Um, I don't want to take any more of uh, our time because we have some questions that we could cover um, that are in the chat box and I'll just go through them myself uh, and read them out. But if anyone has any others, um, please just add them in. Um, the first question is perhaps one for an in another seminar, another day. Um, and I think it touches on Hashim's uh, explanation of GDPR post-Brexit, which is, is in itself quite a topic. Um, if anyone would like to cover that, just um, jump in. I, I don't know if you want to give that helpful explanation again, Hashim, about the UK GDPR uh, as it's now known uh, and incorporated into the Data Protection Act. Um, yeah, so there, the current position is, insofar as there is a current position, is that um, the GDPR has long been incorporated into UK law as is. And we expect um, the situation to largely remain the same, that normal rights and obligations as enshrined in the GDPR are in the UK GDPR. And so we don't expect much of differences there. There are some derogations when it comes to um, government access for purposes of security or, um, or terrorism, but these are derogations which are limited to that field and I do not see them applying to political communication. But again, that's a mammoth topic which probably requires its own seminar, but, but largely the rights and obligations insofar as political campaigning is concerned should remain the same. Brilliant, thanks Hashim. Um, so the second question is also GDPR related um, and I'll just read it out for everyone in case you haven't seen it. So, uh, you were mentioning earlier the difficulties in enforcing GDPR. Do you believe that part of the difficulty derives from the fact that this is left to national data protection authorities whose interpretation of GDPR is not necessarily the same among others? Should the role of the European Data Protection Supervisor be reinforced and should GDPR amended? And also happy data protection day there. Um, so, so does anyone want to jump in on on that? I suppose it's the difficulties of enforcement and the divergence in approach of the the DPAs, as well as the the role of the supervisor, uh, the data protection supervisor. And I suppose that there's that role, and then there's also the European Data Protection Board to consider. So, um, if anyone wants to jump in on this, just chat. Can I try and go first, perhaps, and then uh, let's see if someone else has other Hello. views on this. And I think um, the identity answer would be yes and no, I say, and I think we can see multiple layers of problems overlapping here. So yes, on the one hand, we can say that uh, um, I think as the report shows, um, European countries are taking um, significantly different approaches, even within the common framework of the GDPR. And, but then, of course, if you, if you bring in the picture countries from uh, outside the EU, uh, you will see even more diverging practices. And we know that given the uh, nature of the tech industry and the communication industry um, these days, um, different regulatory approaches uh, can be problematic in the sense that data can travel um, to some large extent um, across the boundaries. And then when regulatory frameworks are different, this can give rise to um, legal inconsistencies, which can be often very problematic. But I think um, my impression is that um, perhaps the most pressing problem at the moment is that at the national level, in many countries, in the majority of countries, perhaps, we see for a number of reasons inadequate um, legal frameworks in that they either fail to capture the complexity of the mechanism or there are uh, inconsistencies within the different rules that govern the same moments. So um, I think those are both, uh, those are two different layers of problem that coexist, um, and, uh, but, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, so yes, the national data protection authorities um, are important in this sense. Um, there was mention of the EDPS. The EDPS has also been doing some work in this sense, which I think 
was quite encouraging, um, at least in principle. That's something I would, I think, a, a more more involvement from these uh, from the um, from the DPS, I think, could be welcomed. Uh, but then, of course, um, the problem also exists outside the EU. Thanks, Paulo. I think that's an interesting point in terms of above national level what mechanisms exist because there is that framework in the EU that's not necessarily replicated elsewhere and the international engagement of data protection authorities is somewhat less structured or has less um, enforcement uh, weight. Um, there's another question that I don't know if this is maybe Mariana I don't know if you could help with this one which is seeking a, a bit more of an explanation on the role of political ads report sorry, <laughs> repositories, um, which is obviously the approach you were discussing in Canada. Yeah, so basically the role of repositories is to improve and ensure transparency of digital campaigning. And the idea of this is, as I said, like all regulations across jurisdictions aim to regulate personalized communications out of secure transparency. and. What we have with these repositories is that they do it because the information is ready to access, open to public consultation, regardless of like time or situation or if whether it the the ad was made in the you know in a piece of paper or it was a digital like message. So basically, transparency is the big answer here. Um, I think uh, that leads me on to a question for all of you in terms of transparency seems to be one of the few things that's kind of been consistent across the different regulatory approaches and um, but my question is how effective is transparency when it's not accompanied by other limitations for example and then also when you look at transparency in practice and I wonder if this is something that Laura Lucy might have comments on in terms of when you have that being implemented by industry, how is what does that approach look like in practice, and and how is that implemented across across the world and, and different countries, and is the consistency there? Thanks, Ailey. I can have a, a go first. Um, yeah, transparency is, is extremely important, um, but then there is the question of what do you do with that transparency? You know, what's what's next? And um, you know, just to tackle the transparency issue, it, it is very unclear what a lot of these companies that work in this sphere are doing. It's unclear what the services that they provide are, and it's unclear where they get the data from. Um, and then in terms of, so this is why we're kind of calling for limits on data collection in the first place, because if you limit the data collection, you in turn weaken the profiling, and that's really important. But then even when you do see the limits on that, what we're seeing in practice is um, quite different across the world. So for example, you know, I loved um, Hashim's you know, um, analysis of the collection of, of data from the voter register, because this is really the starting point in the political campaigning. And at PI, we looked into about five different companies um, in the political campaigning spectrum that um, you know, are under different um, regulations and different laws around the world. And you know, for example, in, in the US, the voter register is freely available um, to buy or to sell, and um, anyone can have have it and so and a lot of companies make good use of that but then in somewhere like France where there are more restrictions on who can access the voter register that does that just means the companies are looking for other ways to collect that data and in one instance one company was literally knocking on doors and they knocked on 300,000 doors to be able to try and obtain the data that would have been in the voter register so even when limits are put in place that doesn't mean the industry goes oh, okay we can't have that like the industry will always try and do a workaround or develop if they really want this data they're going to try and get it and this is something we need to be really mindful of thanks lucy and um, we have one last question and i was wondering in answering it if each each person then wanted to kind of just come in and if you had each one suggestion and feel free if you if there's not if you just can't say one thing that would kind of try and improve improve the situation it can be general or, or specific so the oh the final question is do you think it's good that companies just start banning um political ads in response to greater transparency requirements so i suppose that's like the example of uh, google in, in canada or do we need political ads but in a transparent and accountable manner. So maybe Lucy, if you wanted to just uh, kick off with that or any thoughts on that and also just any thoughts you have on like one thing to improve this situation. 
Yeah, so briefly, um, we we don't think it's a good idea to ban political ads altogether. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, for a lot of the big companies, the, the problem is the business model and, and just banning political ads doesn't solve the problem of how data is being collected and people being profiled. It doesn't go away. Um, also banning political ads, you know, doesn't really impact smaller communities and smaller parties and doesn't really create a level, level playing field in the political spectrum. Um, I think, um, you know, one a good thing to say, you know, positive thing to say is that um, I think it was kind of alluded to before about data protection. We need the regulators to be to be really well equipped to be able to enforce the regulation that we have, and that means that they need to have the proper resources. Organisations like PI need to have um, need to be well resourced so that we can bring our investigations to the attention of the regulator, so that they can test out these very novel uses of technology against data protection law. Thanks, Lucy. I'm going to go through each of you just as you're appearing on my screen. So uh, over to Paolo. Thank you, Hayley. So no, I think this is a brilliant, I mean, both your question and uh, Nicola's question are brilliant. And if I can just merge them very quickly um, with a bit of a, um, so, so yes, no, I completely agree with Lucy. We definitely don't want to have political ads disappear either because they're banned or because um, platforms decide to restrict them uh, to an excessive extent. Um, but on a more personal note, perhaps, uh, I grew up in Berlusconi City uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s when the prime minister was also the owner of all the commercial TV sector, which was all the mass media. I mean, yeah, TV was the main uh, mass media that we had at the time. So media pluralism was really the uh, topic that made me interested in, in media law in the first place. And of course, um, if you want none of the regulatory frameworks that we had back in the day for um, ensuring pluralism in the, broad, in the broadcasting sector would apply here. But I think as a principle, at some point as a society, we decided that it was a good thing that people were exposed to different messages coming from different perspectives. And even though clearly we need completely different frameworks now, I think the principle still needs to be there. And uh, this is something that as a, as a community, both activists and uh, academics and policy makers, Pluralism, it's something we have forgot about because we thought with all this different new outlets that we had there, it was uh, as a problem, it was a really of the past. And I don't think, I don't think it's absolutely the case. So uh, one positive thing for me would be to start a conversation again about um, the role of media pluralism as a policy goal. Thanks, Paolo. Um, Hashim? Um, yeah, just, just, I think that's an excellent point. Just, just to add on that, um, I think, Banning is uh, political ads is something we need to be very careful of. I, I think there's a question of impacting on fundamental rights, uh, the right to receive information and ideas, specifically political ideas, I think could be significantly impacted by a total ban. What my recommendation and what I would point to there is simply the repository of political ads. I think if this is something that can be widely adopted, it would largely deal with the issues which are plaguing this particular uh, uh, sector, which is that if we are concerned about micro-targeting, we're concerned about segmentation and perhaps different audiences being sent different ads, perhaps even contradicting messages, the ability to access these things enables us to know who's sending what and whether they're sending out contradicting messages or whether they're sending out to only a specific audience. So really transparency is the key here. And I think it's, um, we want to avoid sort of using a, a, a sledgehammer um, to deal with the problem. And I think focusing more on transparency might be the best way forward. Thanks, Hashim. Uh, Laura? I'm happy to echo what everyone else has said, but in addition to that, I really want to um, focus on the point about multilateral, multilateralism that Paola was making. I absolutely agree. And this is why at PI, we're not just targeting electoral regulators or data protection agencies, but platforms themselves. And in the next couple of days or early next week, we'll actually be launching an open letter to Google and Facebook, calling on them to adjust their ads transparency standards for political campaigning to ensure that equal standards are offered to users globally. So we definitely think that that's something worth raising with online platforms themselves, uh, as opposed to just only with regulators. 
Thanks, Laura and uh, Mariana. Any last words? Uh, well, I agree with what everyone has already said, just building on Hashim's idea that definitely um, political expression is a fundamental right, as well as data protection. So in this case, and as we all may know, when two or more fundamental rights are in conflict, we cannot repress one to just empower another one. It's all about balancing. So definitely the answer is not banning political ads, but regulating them. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. And Ayuna, do you have any any kind of conclusions or kind of points that you'd like to kind of highlight? Thanks, Haley. Yeah, I mean, definitely to echo uh, what everyone has said before. And and just kind of to, to link it to the profiling point, I think I would completely agree that, I, that transparency is really what is key to making consent to profiling and direct communications meaningful. I think that was something I definitely picked up on through looking at the different regimes that exist and especially the ICO guidance. I think that, um, I think I would completely agree with the ICO kind of uh, guidelines that it's about informing the data subject ha about how the data is being used, providing meaningful information about the reasons for and consequences of profiling. Um, to meet that Article 2 requirement under the GDPR and, and now it's kind of post-Brexit existence in our domestic regime. Um, and, and I think in terms of kind of a, a solution to that, if, if, uh, if it was workable, I think the imprint requirement which Mariana touched on would be really useful in making sure that consent was meaningful and people were fully aware of how their information was being collected and used. Brilliant, thank you so much to, to all of you. I think a lot has happened even in this space in the last couple of years and it, it's ever changing both in terms of regulation and in practice. So I think this is something we'll have to keep an eye on and see how it develops and, and hopefully it does develop. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us for this uh, webinar. And uh, Paula has shared the slides in the chat if anyone would like to have a closer look at those because we know there was a, a lot of information. Um, the full report is on the Privacy International website and um, there's also a link to it in the event page on the Edinburgh University website as well and um, there's a, a number of different resources there that might be of interest to you all. So thank you again to everyone for joining us and um, we look forward to you keeping uh, in touch with uh, both Privacy International and the University of Edinburgh. Thank, Thank you, you Ailey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ailey. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.